I hope you can now see the agenda that I suggest we, we talk through. Citizens Innovation Funds, Biomedical Catalyst, the National Biologics Industry Innovation Centre. Uh, I'll touch on the strategy for UK life sciences one year on, uh, and I attach that document to the WebEx uh, for those of you who have not seen it from before Christmas, and also where we are with the European Clinical Trials Regulation. Uh, these are just really the headlines, headlines of the uh, work that we're working on here at the BIA at the moment. So I'll take, go through each in turn and then happy to have a discussion about anything that people see fit. So citizens innovation funds are a, a policy idea that uh, the BIA is lobbying for uh, at the moment. Uh, this is based on, uh, this is a funding mechanism based on a proven French scheme called FCPI and we are making the argument on behalf of the sector for this new form of funding uh, to be introduced. Um, this is a, uh, a campaign that we launched last September. There are uh, a big document on this explaining the scheme uh, on our website if you type in CIFs or Citizens Innovation Fund. Uh, and really what I was hoping to do here is just give people a progress update as to where we're at. Um, this month uh, we've got meetings. I had a meeting last week uh, hosted by OBN in Oxford uh, on this, which was a useful and good discussion uh, around the details of how this system might work. And I suppose what we're looking to do at the moment is make sure that everybody understands what we're lobbying for, uh, understands the benefit, and we're also meeting partners who can help us on the detail of this scheme, because in a sense, it's a bit like uh, an ISA scheme uh, in terms of an investment vehicle that appeals to a broad group of people, um, but it would be operated slightly differently with a tax break up front for people uh, putting money in and a requirement on the investment uh, and on the investor to put 60% of the money invested into innovative companies and we believe that this could significantly introduce a new uh, uh, form of investment into the biotech community. So I've had a meeting last week in Oxford with uh, the OBN community and we'll be in Cambridge next week uh, hosted by One Nucleus. To, um, uh, to, to get the soundings and insight from there. I think the most important thing from our perspective is uh, this is a campaign that's rolling. Uh, we're well on track to producing a new report on this, which, uh, if you like, brings together some of the other um, players that we've talked to and worked with, because in a sense, we're bringing together the investment community, uh, both, uh, both the specialist life science investment community um, with the retail investment community, people like uh, independent financial advisors, some of the new banks, some of the established banks, um, and the government to say, look, this is a scheme that could work to help drive jobs and growth in the economy. It needs uh, tax relief to get it pump primed and to get it started, but it has worked in France. And we believe that this is a doable package, and hopefully this report will uh, exemplify that. And uh, those of you who know the BIA well will know that we have a Parliament Day at the end of January on the same day as our gala dinner when a number of CEOs come down and lobby for um, the issues that matter to the BIA and this, this issue will be a big focus on that day. Um, we've already secured uh, uh, a meeting, had a meeting prior to Christmas with the, the Treasury and we'll have another meeting at, uh, around the expert detail that's needed on this with the Treasury uh, ahead of the budget which is on the 20th of March. Uh, as always with these things, they're not the sort of thing that can be done overnight, but I think it's something that's giving us goodwill. Uh, it um, means that the BIA has something to bring to the table other than a simple request for cash and um, goes with the grain of types of things that the government's trying to do, uh, supporting an industrial strategy in key growth areas with the ability to unlock the patriotic potential of the British people to invest in areas which will deliver not only, we hope, for them returns on investment in an era when uh, putting it in the bank isn't doing that, but also the chance to progress society in a way that makes sense um, with uh, breakthroughs that uh, are the types of things that people often support through legacies, but um, why wait to do it till you can do it through a legacy when you can do it through active um, active investment. So that's where we are with Citizen Innovation Funds. Apologies if this is a new concept to you. Uh, the basic briefing is uh, on the BIA website, and I hope you can see why that's uh, important to us at the moment. Any questions on SIFs? Steve, um, it's Chris Gardner. My only um, my question for you 
based on the discussion, say that you had down at OBN, what's the what's the feedback from from the kind of early stage companies towards the the SIFS idea? Is there any is there a consensus that it's a good idea? I think they can see the value of it in um, being an additive element to the suite of new types of investment that could come into the into the um, into the area. Uh, I think the uh, in a sense, the early stage companies are slightly more focused on the next thing I'm going to talk about, the biomedical catalyst fund, simply because that's cash that's available in the next three months. And although they can see the value of working on this and they can see how this has worked, and what was interesting was people who had um, a history of investment, sometimes knew of the FCPI scheme, and some early stage companies in the UK have been invested in uh, via the FCPI scheme, they could see the value of it. They were probably more focused on what's likely to happen in the next immediate period but they're absolutely up for it they can see the good the the, the purpose of doing it um, in a sense they just like it tomorrow and I was explaining that this is policy initiative and those don't tend to happen overnight yeah okay that's yeah, that's interesting anybody else <laughs> that's seven so I'll move on the other thing that we're working closely on is uh, ensuring that the Biomedical Catalyst Fund is a success. Uh, this is a, a joint TSB and MRC investment of £180 million over three years to support uh, SMEs at early stage of, um, uh, of, uh, of development of um, uh, life science ideas uh, uh, that need, um, that's uh, it's basically grant funding uh, with match funding. Um, there have been a, this is a scheme that's open uh, um, all the time, but the next submission deadline for those of you who are interested is uh, the end of February. So there is a batch date and then they, they assess them as a batch. So the next batch is looming. And what's interesting, and this is if you like the third batch that they're looking at, is how far through the 180 million they've got within 18 months of opening the scheme, um, which takes us to what we're doing. and. Great to have Alistair on the call uh, from BioPartner. We're coordinating with the various regional groups, uh, writing a report which not only explains how to apply and the value of the scheme, um, whilst highlighting some of the case studies of excellent companies who have been able to do new things as a result of this money. But we're also used that as a platform for lobbying for a um, an increase in funding in this area, showing its success and the need and the desire in the sector and the value that's available in the sector for uh, a continued funding of this um, this scheme. So that's where we're at with Biomedical Catalyst. Um, we're hoping that this document will be a significant part of the TSB Innovate event, which is 11th to the 13th of March in London. But our goal really is to ensure that the scheme continues uh, and uh, has more money uh, going forward. I think that. Um, it's interesting to see that David Cameron cites this as, a, as his top example of a successful piece of uh, industrial policy in his uh, speech before Christmas. Uh, David Willits believes it's a success. Uh, so I think we, um, we have moved it from where there were some concerns as to whether it was working or not last summer in government to being seen as a solid success. The trick now is to continue that in, a lot, in an era where public finances will be looked at in the run-up to the budget as to whether this is something they wish to continue or not. So that will be our goal. And again, this will be a, a key target for us um, in the coming months. I realize it's not applicable to all BIA members, but in our role of supporting the um, emergent sector, this is a, a vital part for them. And many of them have seen, uh, seen significant value from it. And I hope um, the report that we're writing will be the uh, center post around which um, we can uh, drive forward a uh, a lobby campaign for a sensible uh, re-funding uh, of this scheme. Any questions on the Biomedical Catalyst, the BMC, do please uh, get your applications in. And if there's anybody who's interested, um, we do have some expertise in um, how best to do this. And you can contact us uh, at a separate time. So any questions? Steve, Ben Sykes, BBSRC. Uh, is it close to Large Pharma when you mentioned SMEs and early support? Correct. It, um, it technically is, is uh, the, the small companies need to apply for it. Um, some of the big farmers, uh, through their investment arms, have been able to provide uh, match funding to the small players. I'm 
I've counted to seven in my head again there, so I shall move on. Another thing that we're working on at the moment is the National Biologics Industry Innovation Centre. This was uh, uh, announced in the Government in the Life Science Strategy One Year On document uh, published in December, available on the BIS website. Uh, I've also attached it to the details of this call. Uh, it's a £38 million uh, initiative coordinated by the High Value Manufacturing Catapult at Wilson. Uh, CPI is the organisation there. I think it would be fair to say that there was some sector surprise at this uh, having popped out at the time. We welcomed it and we uh, absolutely see the need for support for uh, innovative manufacturing and, if you like, prototyping uh, biologics. So uh, it's a great thing for the sector. Uh, I think there is still a, a challenge as to what this means in detail and um, uh, there's been set up a steering group uh, uh, rapidly since Christmas uh, that the BIA will have representation on. So I think this is one that uh, you'll see move uh, rapidly this quarter um, and uh, has the potential to uh, support the sector in terms of uh, uh, particularly manufacturing innovation and scale up. Um, but there may well be some linkages here with ideas that are emerging from uh, uh, some of the bigger players that um, uh, have established uh, manufacturing in the UK. So uh, I think this is a an important scheme. I think it's a, the details are emerging, but it's certainly something that's high on our, uh, our agenda this year. Any thoughts here? Steve, Ben Sykes, BBS RC again. Um, is, is this 38 million being viewed as R&D money, or is it for capital and infrastructure investment at the CPI? That's a very good question. Um, it certainly fits with the government's intention to spend on uh, capital and infrastructure. Um, I think uh, some people see value in a bricks and um, uh, bricks and mortar uh, building. Uh, others can see that there may well be uh, additional value uh, from working with building on the expertise that exists in the manufacturing sector. And I think there is an open debate as to how this might best be uh, best be used. Um, particularly if uh, the initiative is able to leverage in uh, additional partners with um, additional views as to how the investment might best be spent. So it comes from the, the capital um, and infrastructure budget, um, and there's discussion as to how that might best be used at the moment. So if you're interested in this, do please contact us, and we'd be keen to make sure that uh, your views are represented. So uh, I suppose in overall terms, uh, the big document for us from the government at the back end of last year, and apologies, this is such a government-focused uh, presentation, it just seems to have been the way it falls this quarter, um, was the strategy for UK life sciences. The one year on report was published last uh, December by the government. Uh, I think what's important for us is it's great that life sciences are still a priority area and industrial strategy, but we need to be mindful that biotech is now seen alongside devices and diagnostics as uh, an area for e-health and others uh, for um, uh, jobs and growth in this sector. Uh, interestingly, there's lots of developments within UKTI, UK Trade and Investment, that are look, reviewing their positioning on this, looking at which types of trade fair they go to, how they support things in um, the uh, access program to trade shows, um, and uh, I think there will be some internal machinations within uh, UKTI that will be important for us companies that are looking to uh, go overseas to partner or um, uh, uh, go to trade shows because I think that um, process is being shaken up within uh, within the UK government. We're well engaged in that process. Um, I think uh, it's great to see that David Cameron as Prime Minister remains engaged in this both through speeches and time and you can always tell a politician is involved if they mention it in speeches and spend their time having photos uh, uh, in, um, uh, in the sector so that's good. David Willits is key, and uh, it's very good that through the pumps of the um, reshuffle, um, he's not moved, so he is committed to the sector and remains in a key post uh, within um, within the coalition government. I suppose one thing that uh, slightly concerned me about the strategy from life sciences was there does seem to be a disconnect between uh, the debate in government around this, largely led by Biz, and the um, uh, discussion around pricing and reimbursement and the new uh, pricing scheme, uh, the uh, renegotiated PPRS or new scheme, value-based pricing, which is being done with the Department of Health about paying for drugs and 
I think I just need to watch that. We need to be aware of uh, the concern that, you know, in a sense, um, those two could come apart. It's important to keep them together from my perspective. Any thoughts from anybody who's either read the strategy for UK life sciences or um, uh, reflecting on this? I've got to seven. Uh, and for those of you who've joined, I count silently to seven to see if anybody has any uh, any questions. Uh, so I shall uh, move on. Um, and those of you who've joined since eleven. Kevin here, Steve. Just to say, your analysis, your analysis is uh, spot on on all of that. Actually, really um, impressive, and agree agree with it. Thank you, Kevin. So the other thing that's very important for us and uh, has been for some time at the BIA is the European Clinical Trials Regulation. It used to be called the European Clinical Trials Directive, but when a directive becomes a regulation, it means it doesn't have to go through uh, some of the hoops and uh, basically can be imposed by Brussels without uh, the need for national parliaments to uh, get involved. So uh, it's become something that Brussels is going, to, is going to impose on the whole of Europe, which in some senses makes things simpler, but may also uh, mean that it would rub up against uh, Debates around um, uh, UK's place in uh, in, um, in Europe and the debate that we see running uh, in the news uh, uh, today and tomorrow. Um, so the idea really is it's a long-term initiative to make the rules for trials simpler, cheaper, and easier. So therefore, we think it's a very good idea. At the moment, uh, last year in the summer, it was launched by the European Commission and is now going through the EU legislative, what I describe as a sausage machine. Um, we follow this, and if you want to know the details of this, we follow this in every step and move. Um, a big one for us at the moment is we've sent a position paper on the key issues to the rapporteur, the key person who organises this for the European Parliament, who happens to be a UK MEP, uh, Glenis Wilmot, and uh, the BIA also chairs the Europa Bio Clinical, Check, Clinical Trials uh, uh, Working Group. So we have a, if you like, an undue influence for a national trade association on a, a European process because we've been so close to it. I think the key issue that's bubbled up is uh, the questions around transparency, some of which have been prompted by uh, questions around transparency of the European Medicines Agency as a public body, some of which have been uh, given um, uh, prominence by the publication of a, a book by Ben Goldacre. And I suppose uh, where, we're, where we're at is the key thing is to protect commercial know-how in clinical trial applications. Um, I think the, for us the clinical trial applications uh, process is uh, the key one. So if you like there's a debate about what's published once you've done your trial and uh, what's put out when um, at the end of a trial being concluded and uh, questions about what go on uh, with pharmacovigilance for marketed drugs. Um, I think that they are uh, worthy questions to be had but if you like, where we as the BIA are focusing our attention is um, uh, around the debate around what should be made public at the point of an application for a clinical trial. And we're basically arguing that if you make too much of that public too soon, people will be discouraged from putting those applications in, in the EU because competitors will be able to look in and um, get a good sense of an understanding of some of the commercial know-how and sort of where you're going and the, the trial populations that you're picking will be of commercial interest to, to other people. And what that could do is if that's too open too early, it doesn't protect patients. And what it does is it drives that information, uh, so it drives that, that work to um, jurisdictions where such uh, requirements are not needed. Um, and we focused on that narrow issue. Uh, it's quite uh, a detailed issue. We've got plenty of briefing on it. And if you're interested, uh, we can provide more, but that's where we're focusing at the moment. And I suppose our strategy here is to work very closely with the great links we have with the academic and research charity base in the UK, because that as a coalition is a more influential group in, uh, in Europe. And um, we're actively engaging with uh, all of the relevant stakeholders, ensuring not only that we're pushing at a European Parliament level, but also making sure that the UK government and the regulators understand the uh, the view of not only us as uh, the representative of uh, industry, but of uh, academic and research charities, because often these are, uh, at early stage, these are partnerships, um, and we wouldn't want those to be um, stopped as a result of these changes. 
sorry, a bit long there on the clinical trials regulation, but I'll do my pause for seven and see if there's any thoughts or questions. I see one's coming on chat and I'll have a look, see what that is. Um, Steve, it's um, Alistair here from Biopart. It's not a, not a question really, but a, but a comment and sort of stepping back a little bit to your earlier about, about clinical trials. Um, we uh, tend to represent the UK abroad um, as an internationalizer of, of life sciences, um, but equally we get asked a lot of questions by people who are interested in, in coming into the UK. And it does appear um, from the outside at least and, and sometimes from the inside that getting into clinical trials in the UK um, has many more barriers than, than it has sort of um, obvious, obvious openings. And I think um, you also highlighted an, an article in The Guardian recently um, where uh, it was an NIH had conducted a, um, a survey on um, patient recruitment and they came up with um, basically being sort of shoved from pillar to post, um, not finding a point of contact where they could actually get into uh, clinical trial recruitment. And it seems to me that, that this is an issue that has to be addressed, uh, that there should be um, very obvious points of contact and very obvious processes how you can get into clinical trials in the UK if we're going to promote that. Alistair, I absolutely agree. I'd make two points on this, and this is a topic that was uh, uh, a large part of discussion in the joint conference the BIA held with the ABPI and um, uh, and NOCRI uh, last autumn. Uh, so, I mean, my, my thought on this is um, is that it's a mixed picture. There's been a lot of work done by Louise Wood and colleagues in the and her colleagues in NOCRI and the DH Department of Health in the UK to address these challenges but people's experience is largely based on the last time they went through this process and how it worked for them. Uh, and I think that there is um, increasingly some good practice, particularly for those people who've used the one-stop shop to the NHS clinical trials group that is NOCRI. I think NOCRI need to do more to tell that tale. And um, uh, it's one of those things where if you use improvement statistics on some key measurables like time to first patient, the UK has done a lot. But if you look at the base from which the UK was starting, um, it's not um, internationally competitive. So I think there's a picture of improvement in the last uh, year or so. And interestingly, the details from the presentation from Quintile suggested that there were certain types of work that the UK was being uh, competitive in being able to get. So I don't, wouldn't want to talk the UK down. But for those of us who are working within it, I think we realize there's still a long way to go and certain things need to be changed. So. Uh, I don't think this is a, an issue of clinical trials regulation. This is a question of how things work in practice, and perhaps it's a slightly different discussion. Um, we're working that through with NOCRI, NIHR, um, as to how we make that happen. And I think the challenge there is there is a willingness from the National Commissioning Board, who take over running the NHS in simple terms from April this year, to make sure that innovation is embedded and the importance of clinical trials is, uh, are embedded there. And um, uh, Louise Wood has made sure that there's some financial levers to keep that, um, keep that those organisations honest on key things like time to first patient and uh, uh, time of getting out application approved, which are important uh, but perhaps not sufficient alone to to make this happen. Does that help? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're not the only country that has issues issues with um, clinical trial and recruitment. It's um, equally difficult in the states, um, but it's you know. It's great to know that, that the issue is being addressed and we look forward to, to progress. And I think the other thing that we're lucky to have here is many of the um, uh, global CROs um, are engaged and providing feedback through the BIA and other, uh, some of the specialist CROs uh, within membership are, are absolutely key to us being able to provide, you know, what is it that the UK actually needs to do to be competitive, which bits should we focus on, and uh, that helps, I hope, drive um, the UK PLC, but more importantly, helps uh, our companies to understand what they could be doing where and helps those companies that are CROs in membership to um, expand their business locally as well. Great. Right. Um, I realise that we're at 11.30. I promise we try and do this in 30 to 35 minutes. I've taken up some questions as I've gone through. Let me see. Uh, I'm being told that the European Commission has just announced it will be consulting on the four chapters of the GMP good manufacturing practice guidelines over the next six months and 
we'll be sharing this through our MAC committee and other interested parties. And um, uh, some, there's some other issues that people are keen to talk about as well. So my final slide is uh, dates for your diary. Uh, I look forward to seeing many of you at the gala dinner on the 31st of January. Uh, we've set the dates for our key finance event, the CEO and Investor Forum, which will be during the day on Thursday, the 11th of July, but um, start with an evening uh, on Wednesday, the 10th of July, and uh, the Bioscience Forum, which uh, I think people uh, appreciated and enjoyed last autumn, uh, will be on the 10th of October. So that's it in terms of uh, the formality from me. Um, if there are issues or questions that people wish to raise, then now would be a good chance to, to do so. And uh, perhaps we've got a, a few minutes, uh, perhaps up to 10, uh, for people to um, raise questions or things that I haven't covered or things that the people think I ought to, to cover. So uh, the floor is, is yours. Um, do please uh, speak up. So Steve, Ben Sykes at BBSRC, I, I put something through on, on chat for you, um, <clears throat> only if there was time because it's not critical. Um, in BBSRC, clearly, we're, we're working with our um, stakeholders to, to, to implement our farmer engagement strategy. So the company landscape is very important to us in working out how our bioscience researchers funded by us interact with, with us. There has been commentary through your newscast letter that the patent cliff in 2013 for Big Pharma is even larger than 2012, some estimates around about the $30 billion mark, um, with certain companies um, affected more than others, clearly. Are you making any predictions about what the pharma company landscape will look like by, say, December this year? Um, it's, a, it's a tough question. Yeah. Um, I mean, this is uh, pure speculation by me informed by the chats that I've had. I mean, I would expect to see continuing consolidation in the pharma landscape and you see continued speculation of very big companies looking to, with money, and there are, many of them are sitting on money, looking to acquire pipeline, um, and you can see companies that have pipeline. Perhaps we'll see some of that um, uh, continue this year as we have done across the sector for uh, a number of years, um, and perhaps that will be one outcome. Um, it will be interesting to see uh, whether um, uh, what will happen is uh, acquisition of some of the uh, bigger biotechs by large pharma being the way that they execute um, that strategy. Uh, so that would be my speculation. Um, the other thing that may happen is that they could uh, move further up the, uh, the development stage and um, with the range of cash that they've got and the range of vehicles that they've got, both in R&D and investment vehicles, to acquire or invest in earlier stage biotech. Um, and I think we'll see a, a number of those models through the year. I think the, um, the idea that uh, uh, Abbott have split into Abbott and AbbVie is very interesting at the start of the year and the way that, they, that their business strategies works. We'll be following uh, with interest um, the changes that people may have seen at AstraZeneca uh, in the last week. And uh, the new CEO, Pascal, now seems to be uh, developing his um, strategy for the company there, another one that I think is probably worth watching. But um, I'm a, a, as much an interested spe a spectator, although there may be colleagues here who have comments that um, would be able to comment on Ben's question. I take that seven seconds of silence as um, people. Um, Perhaps not moved to uh, moved by the spirits to, to contribute on that on that one. Uh, is there anything else that um, uh, that people would be keen to uh, to talk about? Things that I've completely missed, or um, anything really that uh, you'd like to use this time for? Things you think that I perhaps should be focusing on that um, that I'm not, or um, perhaps you were uh, hoping for, for something completely different from this? Um, uh, any reflections really, either about um, topics, um, style of this, whether this works for you from you know, uh, I don't need to see your, your face, the slides are wrong, through to the, the objects are wrong, would be really helpful for me as this is the inaugural um, uh, version of this. Hi Steve, uh, Chris Gardner again. Um, I, from, from my point of view, I think this is actually really useful forum. I'm somewhat skeptical about webinars um, and not the most technically advanced. Um, and I think that 
it, it does make a difference um, being able to hear you speak face to face and, and hopefully I think if, if it can gather a bit more momentum we get a few more member companies on as well um, I can see it being a really useful a really useful addition to the to the communication that's already happening thanks Chris Steve Ben Sykes BBSRC uh, um, can I uh, encourage you to continue with these I think it's been a really good start and and um, I think that the, the future ones with, with more participation could, could get better and better. Thank you. I think there's a trade-off as to a, a group that's small enough to be able to be able to have a chat and 10 to 15 I think is the max you can do that effectively on a webinar um, uh, versus everyone's engagement and perhaps it will, we'll, we'll experiment with a variety of things. Uh, individual topics may work and these more general updates are also useful for, uh, for people I hope as well. Any more for any more? I don't want to outstay my welcome. I always think keeping these things focused is a good thing to do. Um, so unless uh, uh, there's any more for any more, I shall in seven seconds suggest that we uh, say thank you very much for your participation. Any feedback on email will be really helpful. And uh, I hope you found this useful uh, and um, insightful. And I look forward to your participation at this and other BIA events um, uh, and talking to you uh, uh, going forward. So. With that, thank you very much. Um, uh, I look forward to seeing you all soon. I suggest that we close it there. Thank you.